Good evening, I am Ibrahim Sani and this is Market Talk. Our focus tonight is on the US conglomerate and Fortune 100 company Honeywell International Incorporated. Honeywell is an American multinational conglomerate company that produces a variety of commercial and consumer products, including engineering services and aerospace systems. The business of aerospace suppliers continues to dominate the market. Large aeroplane makers like Boeing recently created a new unit to develop and build aircraft avionics systems, focusing on equipment for future products and deepening relationships with Honeywell International. Just last week, United Technologies Corporation made an approach to acquire Rockwell Collins Incorporated in a bid to enlarge the two aerospace suppliers. And while mergers like these, which could take the value of exceeding 20 billion US dollars, the conversation will be on how players in the sector, such as Honeywell, are going to function in a highly regulated and highly capital intensive industry. Joining me today is my guest, Brian Greer, the president of Honeywell Southeast Asia. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks very much. Great to be here. The, as mentioned just now, there are mergers happening. There are uh, the aerospace companies that are being highly regulated and, and all this. How does Honeywell function in such a capital-intensive industry such as the aerospace sector? Well, you know, we're a company that's been around for a long time, 100-plus years. Um, we have a very, very diverse portfolio across all the major systems on an aircraft. And for us, you know, this type, this is, this is what we do, right? We understand that uh, it is capital intensive uh, to get on the new platforms that are coming out, whether it's Boeing or Airbus or Embraer or, or whatever. Uh, you have to invest tens and sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars to do so. Um, that's part of, part of our industry. Um, the great thing about Honeywell's business is, is that we're, we're kind of OEM agnostic, if you will. In other words, we can provide systems, and we do, to all of the OEMs out there. So no matter whether there's um, you know, um, companies getting together or one company wins or another, Honeywell usually uh, has bids on for, with all these various OEMs. And so then we get to become on those, uh, those platforms. A uh, quick check on Bloomberg could actually discern the stock prices going up very steadily over the past five years. The revenue has been steadily increasing as well. Everything seems to be going quite rosy for a company like Honeywell. Then yeah. the question now is, do you think that you are relying too much in the aerospace sector? Because it does contribute to about 36, 37% of total revenue for this year alone. Uh, do you think that there is time and need for a, a company like Honeywell to diversify the business away from uh, aerospace? Yeah, you know, actually, we're, we're already diverse, very diverse. And this has really been the strategy for Honeywell for quite some time. I've been Honeywell 15 years now, ever since our um, previous chairman, Dave Cody, got there. And, you know, we've done over 90 acquisitions and 70 divestitures during that time to build the portfolio that we have that is diverse, and that was the whole focus of it. So we're in different industries, short cycle, long cycle, all of those things which we uh, believe gives us an advantage when one business is up, one can be down, short cycle, long cycle, whatever that is. Um, so from my perspective, aerospace happens to be the biggest one, but uh, you know we're in the oil and gas industry, we're in the home and building controls, we're in industrial safety and mobility devices. And so we have, and we have big stakes in all of those. So it's not like those are very, you know, small. Um, so from my perspective, um, I, I think it's actually a good mix. Um, I don't think we depend too much on aerospace. In fact, over the last uh, year, um, our performance materials and technologies business has been, you know, really driving a lot of the growth that we've had. While aerospace has waited for a lot of the investments that we've made. Uh, to actually um, bear fruit uh, when those aircraft start to be coming produced. Okay, um, that's true uh, because quarter on quarter analysis does show that performance materials have been mm -hmm. increasing in terms of revenue quarter on quarter, uh, somewhere around 20% for right. three quarters ago uh, to 23, 24%, which is in the current quarter. Um, uh, does it mean that performance materials does have a big uh, future in the space of Honeywell? Oh, absolutely. It, it's huge. Uh, you know, a big, a big portion of what we do is in the oil and gas side of things. So, over, obviously, over the last two to three years, you know, that's been down a bit. 
But again, that's part of the diversity and the strength of the Honeywell portfolio. While that was down, other portions of the, of the company were up. But certainly oil and gas is starting to take a rebound. You know, we're starting to see some folks that are making some purchases that they wouldn't have, have done before. I think part of that is pent up demand that we're seeing. We're now getting a lot of orders. And, and so I think you're getting some of that effect. But really, it's driven more by the technology advances that, that we're making. You know, in our um, process solutions side of the business, it's moving um, very quickly into the connected side of the world. It used to be years ago that you had to have lots and lots of people at a refinery or a petrochemical plant to man it and all that. We can do that all, not only by having a person that's monitoring the system that basically controls the entire facility, we don't even have to have them on site anymore. You can have them at a central command post and all that information is passed through the cloud and all the analysis can be done through very advanced data analytics and data scientists that we have doing these things. So the ability to be able to effectively and cost effectively run these plants, given what's happened particularly on the oil and gas side, is really where a lot of the companies are focused now. Not so much on the capex, but on the opex. And it's really driven, I think, a lot of the oil and gas players to look very hard at their businesses and become uh, more cost conscious. And this is where Honeywell can really provide immediate benefits to that. Do you think that the uh, uh, Southeast Asian market is uh, going to face quite an optimistic future in terms of the oil and gas sector? We do have large oil and gas players in the country that are, again, mm -hmm. uh, you know, echoing what you said, becoming a little bit more cost effe uh, effective and cost right. efficient. <clears throat> They do risk, uh, you know, uh, winding down their operations to a point where it becomes uh, uh, less profitable for them to do so. Do you think that Southeast Asia is indeed facing an optimistic future in terms of the oil and gas sector? Uh, yeah, I, I would say overall, I mean, just from what I see in the region, you've got major, you know, national oil companies in almost all the countries uh, here in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, each of them has their strengths and the things that they, that they focus on. And I think they're pretty smart about, the, about those areas. Um, I think that there's, a, you know, being a, a national company, uh, I think there's a lot of areas where they, they can focus on to make themselves uh, more efficient and, and more lean. Um, and I think while they've, while they've been doing that over the last two to three years, you know, being in Honeywell for the last 15 years and every year we have, you know, um, goals that we have for becoming more efficient. And I thought, you know, about seven or eight years ago that we were kind of at the, at the end of where we could do, that we were right down to the nitty gritty. Every time I think that, we always find more ways where we can become more efficient. Some of that is enabled by technologies, you know, which are happening very much. So that's us employing our own technologies to be able to do that. And others is just people becoming smarter about how you, how you spend and, and all of that. All right, we'll take a short break. Uh, but when no. we come back, we'll take a look into the consumer aspect of Honeywell. Don't go anywhere. Market Talk. I'm your host, Ibrahim Sani. Today we have a Fortune 100 company joining me, Honeywell Southeast Asia President Brian Greer. Brian, of course, Honeywell doesn't just have industrial clients, you do have consumer clients as well. And one of the core things that is being brought to the market right now is on the home solutions technology, uh, particularly right. on the tie up with Google. Could you explain a little bit more on this particular uh, uh, business approach? Well, we have, you know, we're really focused on the connected home. You know, we really believe that that's a space, as do many other folks, that uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. And it's one of the first places where you can really apply the whole connected uh, thing that we've been looking at. We have partnerships with, you know, uh, Google, Amazon, all the big players in that space. And, but we really feel like we have a lot to bring to the table there. Because if you think about the IoT, and we talk about it a lot, and in that equation, we talk, we've been talking a lot about the I and the companies that are providing that the internet and the connectedness. We haven't talked a lot about the T, the things. And that's where Honeywell, I mean, we have thousands and thousands of things you know, in our portfolio. And so for that IoT value offerings to make sense, you have to have a combination of those things. And I think a lot of folks are still looking for what that right combination is so you can provide an offering to customer that, they, that they'll actually value and pay for. 
Right. One thing that I want to uh, highlight is on yeah. the connected aerospace as well, because this is another aspect that uh, dwells between consumer and also uh, corporate clients, where mm -hmm. uh, Honeywell is uh, touted to bring you know fast internet in the hands of uh, aerospace travelers. Is this the new future? Oh, no, no doubt about it. I mean, everyone has been used to having internet on aircraft, but the reality is, is most of them don't work very well. You know, it's slow or it drops or whatever. Um, so Honeywell, in our partnership with Inmarsat, we provide the hardware systems and we actually provide some of the services for the business jet community also uh, to buy the bandwidth. But we provide the equipment that will bring from Inmarsat's new um, constellation of satellites truly high-speed internet. And not only high-speed, it'll be like you're sitting in your home or at Starbucks or whatever that is, but also allow you to be able to carry connections whether you're over land or you're flying across the ocean to another continent, and it'll all be seamless. And it seems, it seems like, you know, how can we have that right now? But that, that really is going to happen five years from now. A lot of us are going to can't remember the days where you weren't connected when you were on an aircraft. You know, I, I'm sure you get this question a lot, but yeah. really, is uh, the issue of us being too connected a big problem? I mean, you know, I, I've watched enough sci-fi movies to know <laughs> that it's not always a good idea to have too much robots and AI technology near yeah. you. But again, on the flip side, as we mentioned just before this interview, yeah. this is the inevitable moment that we are facing right now. What do you think the future holds for us? And, and again, do you think that we are too connected? Well, just you know, from a personal perspective, um, I think it's a reality, right? I mean, there's this inevitable march of technology that goes forward and it'll never go backwards. And the reality is that the connected space is where the mega trend is going. This is where the world's growing. And it will fundamentally reshape the world. Um, when you talk, start talking about the, connecting the digital, the physical, and that's what I was talking about a minute ago with the IoT. We have all these physical things that we have. It used to be digital to digital. Now we connect the physical things with that. And it's going to create ecosystems of products and things that we haven't even been able to imagine. So the question is, are we too digital? Are we too connected? To me, it's not so much about that. I think that's going to continue. It's about how we put together systems and offerings and ecosystems that truly provide value to people uh, versus just filling up the space, if you will. And of course, the question now is on the consumer aspect, mm -hmm. which is basically taking data from uh, you know, uh, uh, homes right now. Right. Uh, the businesses that you're striking with, Google right now, puts uh, your technology <coughs> inside people's homes. Millions, hundreds of millions, in fact. Yeah. Um, is this a, a, a potential for data breaches? Is this a potential for um, companies like yourselves learning too much about the way consumers behave at home? Well, I mean, I think, I think these types of um, risks have existed for quite a while, right? I mean, Honeywell's already in 150 million homes and 10 million buildings and 10,000 factories. So we've been in there for a long time. I think the issue now is around the connectedness, kind of back to that theme where you can take all that data now and you can connect it to big platforms out there that can do something with that data. But you know, from my perspective, it's really gonna be the people who, who are in the homes deciding what they wanna connect. It's a personal choice. You don't have to have these items, but if you want them, they'll be available. But when you take that data and you put it into a, a, a platform that can do something with it, like Honeywell's building a, what we call our sentience platform, mm -hmm. which allow us to go in and look at that data and either give that information back to the consumer that will help them out in some way. Um, we can use it for ourselves to be able to determine how to build better products that we can provide to the market. Or you can actually create what we call you know, the big data out of it. And, you know, and it's data that will be used by people to be able to provide additional services to people in the market. Is there a risk that it can be used you know, in, a, in a way that's not productive? Sure there is, but I think that's existed for, our, for a long time. Right, we'll take a short break, but when we yeah. come back, we'll take a look into their competitors. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to Market Talk. I am Ibrahim Saini. Today I have with me Honeywell Southeast Asia President Brian Greer. Brian, if we take a look into the uh, comparisons uh, of uh, similar companies within your sector, mm -hmm. um, they pale in comparison in terms of size, in terms of value, mm -hmm. in terms of market capitalization. Um, and, and because of Honeywell having this very extensive lead in the financial might in these mm. sectors that you operate in, not just in uh, home and technology and, 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 and uh, aerospace and many others, um, the fact remains, is it too large of a company to a point where uh, competitors are now being squeezed out of the market because of Honeywell's strength and might? Oh yeah, I don't, I don't think that's the case. I mean, if you if you look at across all the various industries we're in, whether it's aerospace or oil and gas, performance materials, um, building solutions, industrial safety and, and mobility, there are so many other players in that space. And the other thing I'd say is, is that, you know, if you looked at uh, an industrial company 10 years ago or 15 years ago, it was really about those products and they were relatively static. You made technology advances, but it was product to product advances. The topic we were having earlier about connectedness, right? This whole thing is changing. It's about this digital to physical. And so now it's not so much just about the product that you have, it's how that product connects to the digital world and the services and the things that you can wrap around that. So to me, I mean, I, I look at Honeywell right now and uh, we have competitors, partners, and customers now that we didn't have f five years ago. And it continues to accelerate. So to me, the whole, you know, the whole world is changing relative to all those, you know, the, your traditional competitors and how that used to be. It's advancing very, very quickly. So to me, there are, you know, we have competitors now that are coming, you know, that we never even saw coming before. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, it was very easy to predict that. So I don't, I don't think that's really the case. I mean, we're working very, very hard to become what we call a software industrial, which is, you know, take our products, but then find out the, you know, how we can connect those to what's happening with the rest of the, rest of the world, you know, through the cloud and all of that, and offer additional services to our customers because it's, it's becoming more and more about the whole solution of what you provide and not just that product. If the intention is to build uh, Honeywell into a software industrial company, Mm -hmm. um, what would be the kind of market that you think would be appropriate for uh, Honeywell to pursue? Something like a stable market, like Western Europe, like US, or a, a, a growing market like um, Asia, or Southeast Asia for that matter. Yeah. Which, company, which markets would actually suit best in terms of achieving that dream of becoming a software industrial company? Well, I, I think it's both. Uh, and for different reasons. Um, if you look from, a, from the developed markets right now, clearly you know, some of the offerings that I think will evolve out of what we would provide or other folks like us would provide um, require maybe a certain level of um, discretionary income to be able to afford those things, uh, sophistication relative to being ready to move to those types of solutions and, and all of that. Um, the only thing is, is that the developed markets aren't growing very quickly. Right, you know, look at it in the U.S. and and uh, Europe. You know, if it's two percent, you're doing pretty well. Whereas if you look in the developing part of the world, and particularly here in Asia, and particularly Southeast Asia, where it's all developing markets, you know, you look at the growth rates here, and it's in the five and six percent range. Um, those are much more attractive markets in many in many segments, particularly in the mid segment. I mean, just if you look at Southeast mm -hmm. Asia, for example, you have 600 million people in this mm -hmm. part of the world with a rapidly growing uh, mid market segment. And if you look at the growth that's going to happen over the next 20 years, what all the experts are saying, it's really this mid-segment of the market that's growing. And Honeywell is really focused on that segment of the market to provide um, value to them and to provide the type of products they want that only used to exist in the high end. But you, you do it into the mid-segment, and we believe there's a lot of uptake to happen there. One uh, subject that we haven't touched uh, quite uh, extensively is on the safety and productivity part of the business. Mm. Um, and, you know, it, it does constitute quite a sizable uh, chunk of revenue to Honeywell, uh, uh, this quarter at least, with 23, yeah. 22% of revenue. Yeah. And yet, uh, you know, I'll, <clears throat> I'll be hard-pressed to find any press releases, particularly in this space, is this indicative of the fact that uh, the safety and productivity sector of the business is a grandfather industry, something that is safe, something that is uh, uh, stable, and therefore not much uh, you know, new things can be uh, created from this particular segment of the business? I think, I think to some degree that might be true, 
right? If you start talking industrial safety equipment and things like that, it's kind of been what it's been for, for a long time. And if you talk about mobility devices and all that, you know, we're constantly releasing new product developments. We're enhancing what we've had. Um, we're connecting it more to the cloud, providing all of those kinds of things. But I think what you're going to see, particularly in the industrial safety side of things, is that, you know, again, another figure, Honeywell is on 500, we have products on 500 million industrial workers out there, right? So it's a huge, huge number. Um, we're looking at how we can connect that. Mm -hmm. Right, and connected from the perspective of being able to give people, not just be able to give them a safety vest or ear protection, but give them information around that that will allow them to make better choices about how to remain, remain safe and do it in an efficient way. And of course, uh, another aspect I want to pursue is on the government relations uh, that Honeywell wants to strike or is striking right now. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a collaborative effort between Honeywell and the government of Malaysia? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's tremendous. One of our um, big decisions in um, choosing Kuala Lumpur as our headquarters for Southeast Asia was about that. You know, we have uh, our largest avionics facility in the world for Honeywell's in Penang, up north. And we have another facility for our performance materials and technologies business also. They've been in place since 2008. They're fantastic facilities. And part of that has been the relationship that we've had with the Malaysian government has been very, very proactive in, in being helpful. So when we were looking for our new, um, our new headquarters, um, the timing was good. Uh, MIDA we had just started their new principal hub initiative to attract multinationals like Honeywell to put their regional headquarters here. So uh, we became the first member of that, of that principal hub. And uh, you know, my relationship with MIDA, with Datuk Pung there, and with InvestKL, with, uh, with uh, Datuk uh, Zainal, uh, very, very positive. You know, they're on my cell phone. Uh, we talk often. and. Um, I think that's one of the big things that Malaysia has going for it is just the way that those organizations embrace companies like Honeywell, um, and we couldn't be happier than to be here. Ryan, uh, we don't have much time left, but you are in charge of a market that is the fifth largest economy in the world. I'm talking about ASEAN here. ASEAN mm -hmm. is celebrating their 50th anniversary, um, and of course, you are looking at 600 million consumers. You just mentioned it just now. What can we expect from Honeywell Southeast Asia? Uh, you can expect a lot. <laughs> in, fact, it's, in fact, it's already started. Um, you know, we've been here for 30, 40 years. But just in the last 18 months, we've really kind of doubled down here. We've uh, invested in a lot more leadership here. We've got a lot, a lot of businesses that are actually based in, in KL now for, um, for this part of the world. Um, in our headquarters, and we just took a new office, combined all of our offices here in the, in the Klang Valley, we have about 450 people. We've got about 1,500 in all of Malaysia right now and about 3,500 across all of, all of ASEAN. Um, but we're going to double that 450 number to probably 900, 1,000 over the next five years because we can see where the, that the growth is there. And for Honeywell, you know, we have, uh, we have a great portfolio, great technologies. We're focused on it from a management perspective. We're going to be local here. And every time that we've done that in the past, uh, we've been very successful in doing that. So I expect us that, that we'll be the same here. Brian, that's all the time we have for today. Yeah. Thank you for joining me. I've been speaking to Brian Greer, the president of Honeywell Southeast Asia. That's it for this episode of Market Talk. Send us all your feedback on all our social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Listen to this interview on your podcast. Simply search for Astro Awani wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Ibrahim Sani. Thank you for watching and goodbye.